Oh, you've got a bad case of skill issue. But I've got just a treatment for it. Elf, or executable and linkable format, is... Are you sure about this? Okay. An object file format. Thanks for watching. ELF is the de facto standard executable format on Unix-like systems. It was specified in System 5 ABI. Here's a side note. Before you go all, actually, the F in ELF is for format, I will continue saying the ELF format, even though the F in ELF is for format, okay? The F in ELF is for format. That's an alliteration, isn't it? Frivolously flung facts, full, famously for fabrication, furthering, Fascination, um, oh f To fully understand the ELF format, you just need to go through 100 pages of specification. Wait, what? You can't? You have the attention span of a dead goldfish? Let me summarize it for you. To see the structure of an ELF file, we can use read ELF. The ELF format starts with a header. This header describes the file's layout. The header starts with an identification field of 16 bytes. This ident field has four magic bytes, so we know that this is spot <clears throat> elf yep this is elf followed by the class of the file 32 or 64 bits and the endianness then we get a type field which basically tells us if the file is an object file an executable or a shared library the machine field tells us the architecture for which this object file was emitted and on which it is expected to run version is useless the entry point contains the virtual address jumped to, to start the execution once the binary is correctly loaded We'll see how in a bit. We get the program header offset next, then the section header offset. Then we get some processor specific flags, but bro ain't no one got time for that. The header then tells us its size and the sizes of the program header and section header entries and their counts. There are three main types of object files. A relocatable file that holds code and data for linking with other object files to produce executables or shared libraries. This is the .o file you get from the compiler for every compilation unit in your code. An executable file, but you know what that is, so we move. This is equivalent to the .exe on Windows. A shared object file that holds code and data for dynamic linking. This is a .dll on Windows or .so on Linux. From these three types, we can see that the ELF format can be seen in two ways. We have the linker view and the execution view. Let's quickly go over the linker view. The linker view has three main concepts, sections, symbol tables, and relocation. The section header table is an array of section headers, each of which describes the name and type and other properties of a section. Sections are used to organize code and data. Different sections need different attributes, and all sections are readable by default. Each section marks its address and offset in the file, as well as its alignment constraints. But you're already dozing off, so we'll skip the details. Some sections are special. special. Dot text holds the text or instructions of a program. This section needs to be executable. Dot data holds the initialized data of a program. Dot RO data is the same as data but assumed to be read only, hence the RO. Dot PSS is also the same as data but holds uninitialized data. It's a clever way to describe what would be a bunch of zeros without actually storing them on file. As per the spec, sections prefixed with a dot are reserved for the system as they have more or less standardized functions. But your program is not even compiling yet, so linking is the least of your worries. A linker builds a symbol table from the object files. This table holds the information needed to map a program's defined symbols and the symbols it references. An entry of the symbol table has a name, which is the name of the symbol in your code, which can be mangled, a type, for example, object or func, a binding, which is roughly speaking the visibility and precedence of the symbol, a section index, because each symbol happens within a section, and a value, which can be either an offset into the section for relocatable files, or a virtual address for executables and shared libraries. Relocation is connecting symbol references with their definitions. You got a function calling printf, you better hope your linker knows what printf is. In relocatable files, the relocation entry will describe where to substitute the printf address to call the correct function. Please note that this example is very hand-wavy. In practice, relocation is quite a bit more involved than described. In our example code, we can see that all four symbols declared, a, stir, main, and foo, appear in the symbols table. 
And since we have used printf in main and foo, if we take a peek at the assembly, we can see that in both functions, the call to printf was replaced by the e8 opcode for the call instruction, but the address is zero. In the relocation table, we can see two entries that describe the substitution to do in order to link printf with our code. The offsets described in the relocation entries match to where the address is missing. The same relocation technique is also used for the address of the strings we passed as arguments to printf. Alright, oh, let's now imagine that you've actually compiled your program. I know, right? Wild imagination. The ELF binary will need to be loaded to memory to be executed. To do that, we need to look at the program header table. A program header table is an array of program headers. A program header describes a segment. And each segment has a type that tells us how to interpret the element, an offset to the element from the beginning of the file, a virtual address to which the element wants to be mapped, a size, some flags, and alignment constraints. To connect the dots to the linker view, multiple sections can map to a segment. We can see such mapping here. To see the segments in action, let's go over how an operating system can load an ELF executable. First, the operating system loads the ELF file, then passes and validates the header. It makes sure that the magic bytes, the architecture, class, and Indianness all match what's expected. The OS then reads the program header table offset and the number of its elements from the header. If the OS is being clever about how it loads things, and that part of the file is still not in memory, it gets loaded. Next, read the entries from the program header table. Enumerate the entries with type load and interp. An executable is permitted a single interp entry that has a null terminated string, which is the path of the program interpreter. When the US encounters this interp entry, it composes a memory image for the interpreter instead of our binary, and runs it. The interpreter then takes over to load our original binary. A program interpreter is used for dynamic linking, and does runtime relocation to link to dynamic shared libraries. Dynamic linking is beyond the scope of this video, so we'll just assume that we didn't hit an interp program header. The open system then loads all the segments of type load to physical memory. By now, you're surely telling yourself that next, we will map that physical memory to the virtual address we've seen on the program header. And you'd be right. But there's a trick. We are not strictly obliged to do that. If we know that between different segments, the addressing, for example jumps and calls, is relative, we can choose any virtual address to map our program, as long as all the segments are mapped with the same offset from one another. If we do so, our program will run fine. We didn't cover dynamic linking or the inner workings of a program interpreter because that is complex enough to make your head hurt. And you'll need another skill bit. But I'm guessing your head hurts already. You are feeling hyposkeletia symptoms. So take this skill pill. You'll feel better.